Amen. Everybody, welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church this morning. Just take a few moments and greet those around you uh, with the love of Christ.
Psalm 18.2. It says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, and whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And so shall I be saved from my enemies. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is a strong. Yeah. 
going to introduce to you a new song. Um, this song I have clung to for a year, and it reminds me of just the beautiful Savior that we worship and the beautiful sacrifice that he made. And in tough times and in trials, it makes it, you just see the beauty of your suffering. And um, it reminds me to just carry the name of Christ wherever I go.
Jesus. I think when we were singing that song at first, we were probably just singing Jesus and not really thinking about all that that encompasses and all that entails with a name that is above every name, Jesus. His character, his attributes, the fullness of Christ, all contained in who he is. We are here to worship him in spirit and in truth to give him our full devotion, our full attention, Jesus. Emmanuel, we're all about Jesus, about the cross of Christ and the work of Christ. It's about Jesus and it's here for Jesus that we exist, about the name of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that it is about you and for you that we are here. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to come, to speak to us, to show yourself mighty and strong. May we submit to your will. Lord God, we thirst for you. We hunger for you. And Lord God, we ask that you come in power. And that our lives, when we leave this place, would look more like you. Lord God, as your word is open, may you speak. And draw people to yourself. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that you have given us a hope and a future, that we are yours, that we are called by your name. Work in this place, Lord Jesus. Do what only you can do in this time. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you would, go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And we are in a series on relationships. Seeing your relationships through God's eyes. Romans chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 11, continuing down through the close of the chapter. In verse 11, Paul writing to the Romans says, Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. 
So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Take a journey with me today. Go back to this morning as you were getting ready. How many of you looked in the mirror this morning? I think most of you probably did. A few of you maybe uh, didn't, and we, we can recognize that. Uh, well, we looked in the mirror. I want you to see yourself in the mirror right now. Picture yourself. Close your eyes. No distractions, nothing going on. Close your eyes and see yourself in the mirror. When you look at yourself in the mirror, who do you see? What do you hear being said about yourself? As you're focusing and your eyes closed, thinking about what you look like in the mirror, Who do you see? Are you hurting? You see someone that's broken? Is there a certain sin that you just feel like that's who you are when you look in the mirror? Maybe you feel like there's a voice saying, you're not good enough. You'll never measure up. You'll never make him happy. You'll never make her happy. What do you hear this morning? Are there lots of voices? Are there destructive voices as you look in the mirror? This morning, you can open your eyes and stop thinking about the picture in the mirror because for many of us the picture in the mirror is not someone we want to see it's not who we really want to be but it's who we believe we are see our first point this morning starting out is we need to see who we often believe that we are because the reality of it is is a lot of times we go around putting on a face for everyone when in our mind we believe something else. Maybe it's those voices in our head, the picture that we see in the mirror that we begin to believe about ourselves. We begin to believe lies about who we are or things that we've done in the past, we begin to see ourselves in light of that. And that is begin, begins to be all that we can see when we see ourselves in the mirror, is whatever that past decision was. Cinderella. Go back to childhood. Think of reading the story Cinderella or watching a Disney movie Cinderella. Cinderella, see, she was just a girl who ends up getting in a bad situation. Her mother passes away. Her father marries a new lady. And now there are some wicked stepsisters she has to deal with. And she becomes basically a servant, a slave, even though she was the daughter of royalty. And then comes along the story and she, by miraculous circumstances, begins to be and fulfill what she originally was intended for. She's dressed in beautiful attire, beautiful, headed to the ball. She meets the prince and spends a wonderful evening with him. It is special. It is spectacular. It is like the perfect night. But then the night comes to an end, and she's back to being the servant girl. Many of us have been taken out of slavery and brought in as sons and daughters of God the Most High and yet who do we see when we look in the mirror? We see the slave and the servant. 
Someone bound by the chains of sin or bondage in our life, hearing the lies of the enemy to the point that we begin to believe that is who we are, when yet we're like Cinderella who's been taken to the ball to the place that we belong, the place that God intended for us to be, walking in His power in the perfect circumstances and situations in relationship to the sovereign God, and yet we step back into the darkness and become defeated and held captive by ugliness, by sin. By wrong thinking. In our culture, we spend so much money on counseling. We take more medication than any culture has ever taken. And most of the time, it's because things that are in our mind are the way that we feel about ourselves and we begin to believe about who we are. Cinderella could be like the woman at the well. See, she was a Samaritan woman. In John chapter 4, we hear about this lady and her encounter with Jesus. And she is on her fifth husband. And yet, Jesus sees her need, and He begins to reveal Himself to her, and she begins to find hope. It would have been so easy for her, after running into the village, to hear all the taunts, and, oh, you, you of all people, can come and share about Jesus? She could begin to believe the lies and go back to feeling like she was just that woman at the well who was messed up and begin to forget about what Jesus has done. And the reality of it is, is so many of us who are believers in Christ, we do the exact same thing. We step into the light. We step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And yet, what do we do? We go very, we go right back to those same places. Hearing the voices, believing a lie about who we are. We believe that what we've done defines us. Whether it's sexual sin, unforgiveness, bitterness that takes root, we become somebody that we're not. Pride secret sins that take over and we begin to believe that we are only what we do. You see, when some of us look in the mirror, we think about that adulterous affair. When some of us look in the mirror, we think about the voice that we heard from our father or mother that we never measured up. You just can't seem to get it right, can you? When some of us look in the mirror, we see that secret that we've never disclosed. That when we open ourselves up, we really think, oh, that's that's who I am. Some of us look in the mirror and we see that person who could never keep their mouth shut. Well, I, I can't believe I shared that. That must be who I am. I'm just a loser. I can't keep my mouth shut. It's painful when we begin to look into the mirror and see who we often believe that we are. It's a mess. It's ugly. And yet, if we were really honest, that's what holds many of us captive. It's what holds many of us bound. It's believing a lie about ourselves. Some of us don't just believe it's about what we've done, but we believe the only thing we are is what we do. Some of us wrap ourselves in our identity and our jobs. That I, I, I'm, I'm good at this. This is what I do. I'm successful at this. And so we place our identity in that. And when that's taken away from us and we no longer have that identity or job or career, then we begin to succumb to all the pressures of the world because we've believed this lie that we are about what we do instead of who we are. You see, Peter had this encounter with Jesus. He was changed. He was transformed. He was called out. He would become a disciple, a follower. His new mission was fishing for men. And what does Peter do as soon as Christ is gone? He goes back to fishing for just fish. Because his identity was wrapped in what he did, not who he'd become. Many of us, if we were honest, we'd say, yeah, I I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have my career. 
I've staked it all on that. You see, when we begin to believe these lies about who we are, we begin to become very ineffective for the kingdom of God. Many of you feel like you've got to be perfect to serve Jesus. You've got to have it all together. And the reality of it is, is that's not true. Because he's the one that's got it all together. He's the one we stake it all on. But so often we fall into this trap of thinking, I've got to do it. I've got to measure up. I've got to please God. I've got to be this person. And I, I, if I fail, then I... I yeah, I can't. I can't fail. I can't, I can't go out there and lead this ministry. I can't go out there and do this because I cannot be good enough. No, you cannot, but he is. We become so ineffective, we forget that we were purchased by the very blood of Jesus Christ. Many of you have had big expenses lavished upon you, whatever it may be. Think about maybe the biggest gift you've ever gotten. Maybe it's a new car. Maybe it's a large sum of money. We could have been like the person who had the winning ticket for that huge lotto. But there is nothing, nothing Nothing that compares to the fact that the precious blood of the spotless lamb was spent for you. Nothing. Nothing that compares to that. That Jesus, the son of the living God, died for you. His blood was shed so that you could be covered, so that you could be washed clean. The greatest expense ever paid. And it's done for you and for me. But so many times we forget whose we are. And we start trying to measure up or be somebody or start listening to the voices we once listened to. We live in shame and fear, guilt, trodden. John 10.10, 10, what is... Jesus say about the enemy, he came, comes to kill and destroy. And if we were honest, most of us have wounds all over our face. Because we're hearing more from the evil one than we are from the holy one. In the passage it says, The time has come for you to wake from sleep. The time has come for us to wake up from our sleep and to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. Not who we are in our job, not who or what we've done in the past, but who we are in Jesus. Our salvation is here. It is past, present, it's future. It is, we are in understanding and being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are redeemed. We're called out. We're purchased. We are His. We have been redeemed by Jesus. And we have to change our perspective. Because if we don't, we will continue to hear the lies, be ineffective for the kingdom of God, and walk in shame and feel like we need to go see a counselor tomorrow because all these things in our head keep telling us this is who we are. We're whatever that mistake was. Or we're defined by our job and I just can't measure up and I just can't do this. You see, we receive salvation. And that salvation happens and we, we as Baptists and Protestants often talk about, well, I got saved. Yes, we did get saved, but we're being saved and we will be saved. That Jesus started that work on the day that we accepted him as our Lord and Savior. He is continuing that work today and he will complete that work when he returns back for us. We've got to remember that it's a process, that we don't all of a sudden get it all together. A lot of times we think, well, I accept Jesus and my life is perfect now. No, he continues to change and transform us and make us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. It's a process. Praise God, it's a process. Because I'm not there yet. You're not there yet. But if you've accepted Jesus, he is at work in you. And the work he started, he will complete. 
He's promised that to us. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The process of presently working out our salvation, that we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we're letting him change and transform us. Back to the Romans passage, you see in that Romans passage, it says, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. That look of salvation future, something that we hadn't yet fully taken hold of. We have been redeemed, but we've not received the full transformation of our lives until Christ returns and makes us into the image of his son. You see, how we believe about ourselves impacts how we relate to others. If you believe those voices about who you are, it impacts your relationships. We need to get a clear picture of who we are. We need to get a clear picture of who we are. Some of us, if we were honest, our mirror's a lot like it is when you get out of the shower. It's all fogged up. Oh yeah, we can see our outline. But we say, see a hazy image of who we really are. We forget what we first believed. We forget the day that we stepped from death to life. And we need that picture. We need the picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. The picture that Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, hung on a tree for me and for you so that we could be washed clean, so that we could be made right with the Holy God, so that our identity could be wrapped up in who He is. And that when, we, when God the Father looks at us, who does He see? He sees His very Son, Jesus Christ, because we've accepted Him. His righteousness is now our righteousness. Our sin has been washed clean. Whatever we will do has been washed and taken care of by the blood of Jesus. And when God the Father looks at us, He is well pleased because He sees His Son. And we need to get a clear picture of that because if we don't, we will live in guilt and shame and ineffective lives as believers. And that is not where I want you to be or where I want to be. I want to be charging the gates of hell. I want to be marching in the orders of Jesus Christ. I want to have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me. And the the only way that I can do that is to have a clear picture of what Jesus has done for me, the work that he accomplished on the cross, realizing that he didn't just die on the cross, but he was resurrected on the third day, set me free from sin and death. I don't have anybody to fear. I don't have to fear what you think of me. You don't have to fear what others think of you. You fear God the Father only. You have a relationship with him. You've set free. You know that you have eternal life. If someone were to take your life now, you are free. It does not matter. You're a child of God. That is what we have to remember. We've got to get a picture of that because if we don't, we live defeated. Believing the lies of the enemy that we are nobody. Or you're just that sinner. Yeah. You can look at the person to your right and your left and they are. But if they have accepted Jesus Christ, they are a saint. You're a saint. And many of you, if you're honest, like me, there are days you don't feel very saintly. You're hearing more of the voice of the world or the voice of the enemy leaving you ineffective for the kingdom of God. But we need a clear picture of the work of Christ. You see, he set us free from slavery so that we might be bound to righteousness. The work he started in you, 
He will complete. Some of you today need to hear that. You need to take hold of that because some of you today go, I'm never going to make it. I'm not going to live up to this life that God's called me to. You need to hear that the work Jesus started in you, it, He will complete. You need to see yourself as Jesus sees you. Not as what everybody else may see. You need to come back to the cross of Christ and look upon the Savior and see what He's done for you. See the work that He's accomplished on your behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.17, a verse that many of you would have memorized when you became a new Christian, says that we are a new creation in Christ. We are new. We, the old has passed away. It's gone. Whatever you did in that previous life, whatever thing happened in the past, that does not define you. Your relationship with Jesus Christ defines you. Because when we accept Him, we become a new creation. We step from death to life. You're not that same person you once were. And some of you go, well, I keep acting like it. It's because you keep believing it. You keep stepping back into that old way. You see, we can't really walk in the old ways anymore. Because that's not who we are. We've been set free and changed and transformed. That's not who we are. You don't have to walk in those ways. You get to walk in the freedom and the joy and the delight and the peace and the kindness of Jesus Christ. Because when God the Father looks at you, that's what he sees. If you've accepted eternal life, a relationship with Jesus, if you've let him come in and transform you and take over, It's not what you once did or who you once were that God sees. He sees a son. Romans 6. Just back over a few pages in Romans 6, 17 and 18. The scriptures say, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to that which, which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Don't turn there, but in the, just listen. In Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So whatever that voice in your head, whatever you see in that mirror, if it is anything other than the truth of the scriptures, get a clear picture of who you are by looking at Jesus seeing the work that he's accomplished on your behalf by dying our death. Because now you are his workmanship, created for good works. You've been set free from the chains of sin and death, from bondage, from all that holds you back, from the things that you've done. The, and many of you, you go, well, I've, I've messed up since I've become a Christian. Salvation, present, future, past. He's still working. He's still transforming. He's still changing. You are not that person. You're not that failure. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. So let go of it. Let God have it. And let Him use it. Let him use it. A couple of days ago, I was able to go with some of uh, members here at our church to Quest Community Church in Lexington uh, for a conference called The Uprising. 
And basically the uprising is about the gospel and it's about churches being about reaching other people and churches that are life-giving, that are places that are rescuing the lost, places of hope, that are lighthouses in their community, that are seeing transformation. And it's so awesome when you go because I, I've been two times, two years ago and then uh, a few days ago. And one of the things that is so striking is that no matter where you go in that church, they talk about how people are transformed. People are sharing their stories. And the reality of it is, is every single one of you has a story of who you were and who you are now. And I think sometimes because we don't tell that story, we stay in bondage. Because we're meant to tell the story. We're meant to talk about who we once were and who we are now. And I think many times we forget to talk about who we were and what Jesus has done and magnify him and give him glory and give him praise. And when we forget to do that, we stay in bondage. We stay there held captive by what we once did or who we once were, forgetting the work of Jesus. But when we begin to tell that story and people begin to hear about what Jesus has done in our life and how we've been transformed, it frees us up because we realize that our identity is wrapped up in Him. When you go to the church, they're, they're constantly showing videos or having people walk on stage and talk about what Jesus has done. Here's a conference meant for leaders of the church and pastors. And what do they do the whole time? Parade people in, across stage and on the screen who've been redeemed, who've been set free, telling their stories about transformation. They talk about who they once were. There's some that come to the stage talking about being a prostitute or, or even one of the guys came and talked about having an affair and his wife stood right next to him and, and talked about the struggle and their son came up and talked about running to the church for hope and walking for six months and getting back to that place. And many of us need to be freed up to tell our story, to tell about what's happened in our life so that Jesus can use that to help somebody else because we are messed up people seeking the face of a holy God. And when God the Father looks at us because we've accepted Jesus, he sees us as his sons and daughters. And we need to use our stories to make an impact on other people's lives in our community. We need to be a church that is rescuing the lost, that is going out, and so many people are coming that are unlike us, who are hurting, who are broken, who feel accepted when they come through these walls. Because I can't expect somebody who's never accepted Jesus to get it all right. And even when they do step across the line and come to faith, we show grace because we still mess up. It's quite funny. You go in the restrooms there, and even there in the restrooms above the urinal, there's somebody's transformation story. There are transformation stories everywhere. It permeates the walls of the church that it is a rescuing place. They scrolled across the screen, 19,000 plus names of people who've come to faith in the last 13 or 12 years since they've been in existence as Quest Community Church. They're different in our community and in their community. I'm sure there's people that don't like how they do things, but I can promise you one thing. They're about the gospel and about transformation, and that is what we want to be known as, the church that is about the gospel. It's about Jesus and the work of Christ and what he's done in our lives, and I want to challenge you. What is your story? Because when, you free, when you're freed up to tell that story and start looking at who you once were but who he's making you now, it frees you. Because it gets all the focus on Jesus and not on us. Because there's nobody who can restore a marriage like Jesus. There's nobody who can set you free from addiction like Jesus. And when we begin to share that story about what Jesus has done in us, he gets the glory. And people respond. Who do you see today when you look in the mirror? You're still seeing yourself, not seeing Jesus and his work. The last and final thing is we need to live in light of who we are. We need to live in light of who we are. Verse 13. Actually, let's go back up to verse 12. It says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness. The old way, who we once were. And put on the armor of light who we are now, children of God, children of the light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We're to live with purpose now. 
Without Christ, we're lost with no direction, no purpose. Rick Warren wrote a book that became a New York Times best seller because people are looking for their purpose. And Jesus has it wrapped up in him. When we find ourselves in Christ, we find our purpose. Our purpose is a life meant to glorify and, uh, and, and impact others because of what he's done. And so many of us, again, we, we're living this, seeing ourselves in this mirror and forgetting who we're made to be. We're made to be ambassadors of God. Ambassadors sent out on his behalf. I don't know about you, but I don't have a higher calling than that. I don't have anything that can excite me more than to know that I represent Jesus. I represent a kingdom that will never end. I represent a king that reigns forever over every king. We can look to the Middle East today and see all the difficulties there, all the the turmoil. We can see crazy leaders around our world. But I know a king who reigns over them all, and I represent him. You represent him if you're a child of his. And we've got to go out in that power and in that freedom, living as children of the light, living in the armor of Christ. You each in this room have callings, vocations that are unique, but every single one of you, no matter what your vocation is, has a high calling to carry the name of Jesus. To live as children of the light. Walking in the freedom of the Holy Spirit and the power of God. We have purpose. There's a couple of churches that say it different ways. Some churches say we're the rescue, rescue others. Or the found, find the lost. Whatever it is in our church and in every community of faith that call in the name of Jesus. That should represent us as the people of God. Those who've been recreated, who are made and transformed and changed, going out to rescue others. Many today are wondering why churches are dying. It's because most aren't sharing. Most aren't going and rescuing. Most are hoping somebody will come. And if we live as children of the light, we won't walk in those things that we once walked in. Sexual immorality, drunkenness. We will walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, rescuing the lost. Why did Jesus say he came? To seek and save that which was lost. Are we about his business? Because scripture says that we will be about his business if we know the Father. His business is is rescuing the lost. It's not warming a pew. It's not singing a song. Oh, there's things that are good about coming to church and good about singing songs, but if you're not carrying the name of Jesus to those who are lost and perishing, you're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. Because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if he gives us his message, just as he gave the disciples, if he calls us to go, then what in the world would we do but go and share? Our purpose is clear. And our vocations, whatever they may be, our titles, whatever they may be, that they would all fall under the calling to carry the name of Jesus. We're to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing it is only in the Spirit that we can walk in freedom. We don't open the door to the flesh. We put to death the flesh. We kill the desires of the flesh. We do everything that we can to get rid of and get away from because we have been changed. We're not the person we once were. We love Jesus because he first loved us. He's came and made us new. We're a new creation. And when we walk as to who we are, we don't want those things to be a part of our life. So we put those things to death. We do everything that we can to pursue righteousness, to pursue holiness. We spend time in God's word. We spend time praying. We're faithful to the house of God. We're serving others and we're sharing his name. Why? Because he has been faithful to us and we're changed. We're different. Not because we have to, but because we get to. We get to serve. We get to love others. We get to carry the name of Christ. Not because I have to make him happy. (laughs) He doesn't need me to be happy. He has everything he needs apart from me. 
But I get to, because he loves me, I get to join him in his work. And in joining him in his work, I find delight and fulfillment because I'm acting according to who I really am, a representative of the king, a son and daughter of the Most High. I live daily in repentance because I want nothing to do with the works of unrighteousness. There are many who come to faith in Christ and they think, well, I've repented, I've come to Christ. It's done. Repentance is daily. I don't know about you, but I constantly mess up. I need to come to him daily and cry out to him and and turn away from things of this world and turn to him. I need to pursue him, submitting my life to him, wanting his will above everything else. And I can only do that through a life-giving, abundant, abiding relationship with Jesus. I've got to plug into him. I've got to connect to him. I've got to have that vital relationship. I can't keep going on my own authority, my own power. I've got to have the power of Jesus. I've got to plug in. And only when we do that, only when we plug into Jesus, and only when we begin to see and live as who we are, can we really have relationships that matter. Life-giving relationships. Relationships with impact. Relationships that bring joy and not heartache. Because see, when I see Jesus for who he is and what he's done, and I see myself as God sees me, I'm freed up to love others because I don't have to please anybody anymore. I don't believe the lies about the things I once did defining who I am now. And when I go and share the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter if they receive it or not because I know that Jesus delights because I carry his name. And I find pleasure in that. And it doesn't matter In that, there begins to be life-giving relationships around me because I have peace. I have the joy that I need in my life. I'm not a person walking around in inner turmoil because Jesus has made things right. And in that, my relationships are all impacted because I love my wife better. I'm a better dad, a better friend because I'm plugged into Jesus. And he's filling me with his spirit and with his love, allowing me to go out as his representative. Will you walk as a son and daughter of the king? Close your eyes. Go back to that mirror. Go back to that mirror. Every eye closed, seeing yourself in that mirror. This verse says, put on the Lord Jesus. If you're a child of God, now see yourself as he sees you. Purchased. Forgiven. Son, a daughter. Loved by the king. See your dirty and tattered clothes. Now with a garment of royalty. With a crown upon your head. And a smile across your face because the King of Heaven stepped to earth for you. He came to die on the cross for you to change that heart that was cold and dead to a heart that is alive and full. That's who you are. A son, a daughter. Maybe you're looking in that mirror today and, and, and you can't see that. Jesus has redeemed you. Do you know Him? Do you have a relationship with Him? Jesus Christ may be calling you today as you look into that mirror you still see that broken hurting person the person so scarred and and wrapped up in the bondage of sin and Jesus has come to set you free he's come to break the chains he's come to give you a hope and a future a calling that is above every calling to go and to rescue others to represent his kingdom a kingdom that will not end He loves you. 
He's for you. So as you look at that mirror today, if you're a child of God, are there things you need to throw off? Do you need to come back to Him and see yourself for who you really are? Or as you look into that mirror, do you realize that you're really lost, that you're far from God, that who you, when you see a person who's hurting and broken and in bondage to sin, that's who you really are. You've never been set free. Today can be the day that Jesus breaks in and He sets you free. Hear His voice, not what the world says, not the lies of the evil one. Hear His voice. Every eye open. You know what you saw in the mirror. Now we get to respond. Is there sin in your life you should throw off today? And come back to the Savior that you know so well. Is there a secret in your life that God wants to use the gem for His glory? You see, that's our God. Our God loves us so much that He takes our junk, our ugly, messed up mistake, and uses it to bring Him glory if we're willing. There are things in my life that are ugly, but when I begin to use those things and allow God to have the, His way and talk about he's, how He's changed them, it frees me up and sets others free. Will you use what God's calling you to use today? Maybe as you saw yourself in that mirror, you realized you were far, far from God. Never accepted Him as your Savior. Church, we need to be about the things of God. 3,500 people leave their church every month. We've seen God move this year in our church. But are we all about the business of rescuing others? Commissioned by Him? Do we see ourselves as God sees us? He could have saved people any way He wanted to. But He chose to send the church. Will we go and carry his name? Will we see ourselves as he sees us? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word that is alive and active. Lord God, there are people in this room today who when they looked in that mirror, they didn't want to see who was there. But they saw somebody who was hurting and broken, who was believing lies about themselves. And Lord God, as they looked into that mirror and looked into your word, they began to see the truth. The lies were exposed. And I pray, Lord God, for those who are hurting, who need to know that they are found in you today, that they would come to you, that you, they would climb up in your allow, and that you would love on them, that they would be like that prodigal son running down the road. They would come running into your arms because you delight in them. You love them. Lord, I believe there are people in this room who have yet to come to you, who when they look in that mirror, all they see is brokenness, hurt, and pain. They're messed up. And they've been trying to fix it all on their own or in somebody else. But today they're going to come to you because they know you're the only one who died to redeem them, who died to set them free. And Lord, there's others in this building today who, when they look at themselves, they know they're ambassador. They know they're your child. They've started reading scripture more. They've started praying more. But if they were honest, they've not been too faithful in carrying your name and telling others about the work of Jesus. Lord God, set us on fire for you, for your kingdom. We want what you want, Lord God. We need you. We want our communities and our world to be transformed. We're tired of seeing stories of tragedy. Lord God, help us to see hope, hope found in you. Help us to be about the business of your son. Speak to us, Lord Jesus. Help us to be obedient to you, to do whatever you call us to do in this time of decision, Lord God. May we res respond to you, Lord God, in humility. Help us not to hold anything back. But let you do what you want to do, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us.
If God's calling you to respond to Him, if there's a decision you need to make today, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, come and receive Him. Today, when you go home, tomorrow, when you get ready and look into the mirror, will you remember what the Father says about you and how He sees you? 
or you listen to the lies of this world, choose to take Scripture, take what Jesus has done, the work, apply it to your life. Because He loves you. You're His child. Son or daughter of God. Representing Him. And then this week, who's one person that you can impact with the gospel? One person that you can go and share with. Will you be his ambassador? This morning, Pastor Allen's going to share with us about our communication card. And during this time, you guys can go ahead and uh, be seated. As you uh, are seated, go ahead and pull out your bulletin. And if you would, uh, tear off the communication cards, perforated section. I appreciate Pastor Nathan, man, what a wonderful message to put on Christ today, to put on the light. And for some of you, uh, you responded during the invitation, perhaps even from your seat, and became an altar, and God spoke into your life, and you responded to him in faith, and you needed this today. We want to know that, and uh, we, we want to be able to pray for you. We want to be able to encourage you. So take just a second, and on the back, maybe even now, you're opening your heart to, to God for the very first time, and you're giving your life to him. Just check on that box, today I'm giving my life to Christ. Maybe you need to be baptized. You, you know you're not being obedient in baptism. You've never been baptized through immersion. And you're going to take that step today as God speaks into your heart. Perhaps you're a guest with us here today. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Man, didn't some of our uh, children and youth do a great job? If you were out uh, early today, they had poster boards out welcoming folks. And, and we just want to say that they rocked it, didn't they? Give them a hand. Didn't they do a great job? And, Appreciate them and our first impression ministry. What a great first impression that they gave. And if you're a guest with us here today, we want to say welcome. We're glad that God brought you here today to Emmanuel. If you would just take a moment and fill out the communication card, we'd love just to have record of your attendance today. But, but maybe, maybe you're here and, and the brokenness and the messiness that Pastor Nathan spoke to, is it's, it's heavy in your life right now and you need prayer. If you will write on the back of that communication card, hey, I just need prayer. And if you want to give specifics, you can. If not, that's fine. Just say, pray for me. And we will faithfully lift you up to the Lord, asking uh, for his strength and comfort and courage in your life. So take a second to do that. Maybe you have questions. God just continues to raise questions in your life. Go ahead and do that as well. I'm going to ask Mike Farley to join me up here on the platform for a second. Um, I, I want to make you aware of a great opportunity you have. The first uh, Friday and Saturday in May, we're going to have a marriage conference here. And every one of you, unless your spouse has gone on to be with the Lord, they need to be here, don't they, Mike? Amen. They, they do. Rob and I have gone to two of these uh, Weekend to Remember conferences in our marriage. And they have strengthened us and they have blessed us beyond belief. And we were actually looking uh, for a third, uh, to go for a third time. Same material. They kind of tweak it from time to time. But, but it's that good. It's that encouraging. It's, it's that helpful in every marriage uh, relationship uh, that for the past year we've actually been looking for another one that kind of fit our schedule. And then Mike and, and Kim and Brent and Jenny Lou and some others that are here that are part of the leadership team to, to put this on. Uh, and said, hey, look, there, there's some video curriculum out there. It's a weekend to remember. You can do it in your church. It's accessible. It's inexpensive. And I said, man, let's do it. Let's do it. Mike and Kim went uh, just this past fall. Mike, if you would, tell the folks here, what, what's one reason why they should be here that Friday and Saturday? You know, God designed marriage from the very beginning. He wrote the blueprint. He wrote the book on it. And if we're not willing to read the instructions, we're not going to have successful marriages. And I was thinking about a few years ago, several years ago, when our boys were young, Kim and I had purchased a swing set for them. And when I got home, took it out of the box, I looked at the, the instructions, threw them to the side, and said, I got this. <laughs> so I put the swing set together, and when I finished, it looked great. But I noticed on the ground was a bag of bolts. And I thought, hmm. Swing set looked great, but it wasn't very stable because I didn't have all the bolts where they needed to be because I failed to read. I looked at the instructions, but I didn't read them. And sometimes our marriages look great, but they're not very stable. And we have to take the time 
to invest in our marriages. And in order to do that, we need to know what God's plan is. And, you know, the one thing that it really opened my eyes to was it showed me God's plan. It showed me the sacrifices that I needed to make. It showed me how I needed to love my wife. And it also showed her that. And it, it made a tremendous impact on us. And, you know, one of the things on the way home when we went to the conference, Kim had made mention, she looked at me and said, you know, we're doing a lot of things right. And um, there are things we need to improve on, but we're doing a lot of things right. And so I just encourage you to come and invest in your marriage. Invest in. It's, it's going to get into some, some deep topics and subjects, but it's going to open you up, and it's going to let you know what God expects. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Mike, if you and Kim, Brent and Jenny Lou, and others that are helping direct this, if you'd go back to the information table at this time so folks can meet you back there after we uh, dismiss in prayer in just a few moments and after the offering, and you can go back there and ask questions. But let me say, the two times that Rob and I have been, there have been couples there that were engaged and couples that have been married 50 years that were there that continue to come back to these weekend to remembers. So, so you might be an older couple thinking, oh, we've got this. Listen, this conference is for everyone. If you've been married 50 years, you will be blessed. You will be encouraged. You will be strengthened. Your marriage will grow. This is also for, for couples uh, that are engaged. This, this is going to get you off to the right start. If you're engaged, we invite you to attend. Let me tell you, both times that, that we have gone to these conferences, there have been couples there that have already filed for divorce, and God has used this to rescue their marriage. Uh, at these conferences, uh, there are those couples that are separated, They're set, and only one of the, uh, the spouses will come to the conference, and God uses it to redeem that marriage. Guys, I believe in this. I, I believe in marriage. I believe that marriage is the most important institution that God created. God created three institutions, the marriage, government, and the church. The first institute God ever created was marriage. Before he created the church, he created marriage. That's where it begins at. We believe in it. We believe in your marriage. We want to invest in your marriage. You can even fill out on the communication card now. Uh, hey, sign us up. If you want to go ahead and pay for it, you can. Write the check out, $25. In the memo section, put marriage conference. If you work on a Friday and Saturday, listen, hey, you invest in what's important to you. Some of you need to take off for work. You need to say, hey, look, I'm going to take a personal day. I'm going to take a vacation day because my marriage is important. It's where I get my strength from. It's my future. It's that important to God. I'm going to take off a day. And you just need to sign up for it. Listen, maybe one of you, the spouse, is elbowing the other. Hey, we need to go to that. That would be encouraging. Listen, this is for those that are struggling, and it's for those that are thriving. And you will be encouraged and blessed by it. So please go. If only one of the spouses is elbowing the other right now, hey, just go ahead and sign up and believe in faith. The other one to finally come around. Uh, but I say this as your pastor and as, you, as your friend. I want to see all of you there. I want to see every married couple there that Friday evening and that Saturday morning and afternoon. And I promise you, hey, listen, if it doesn't strengthen your marriage, we'll give you money back and plus I'll cook you a dinner, okay? I'll, I'll fix the best hot dog you've ever had in your life. If, if it's not worth coming, and I promise you it will. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time, and as they come forward, we're going to show uh, the video at this time, as uh, we t I'm going to pray, and then we'll start the video. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for the gospel, that we can have grace and mercy and healing through the cross of Jesus Christ. God, as we take up this offering, God, we do so in a, with a gr heart of gratitude, because you've blessed us so abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's watch the promo video. I think one of the greatest gifts you can really give to the next generation uh, is faithfulness and fidelity in, in, in marriage. You are ancestors to someone yet to come. I expect a husband of mine to be more refined. The thrill is gone. I know the feeling. I was exhausted. This is marriage! This is 
There is no wine in marriage. <laughs> mm, doesn't it smell fantastic? Dave, I really have lost my feelings for you. We were in an argument, and I grabbed her as hard as I could, and I threw her down on the bed. During my depression, I just uh, did some things that really hurt Tony, hurt him real badly, and, and hurt our marriage. Where does marriage always go wrong? It's when I want the right to set the rules by which this relationship would work. You don't have issues. You are the issue, both of you. Our marriage is uh, the central glue as an institution that is holding civilization together. We are responsible then to turn and to forgive others, even when it's horrendous sin. I want to talk to you, but um, I feel a lot better if you put that knife down. You cannot have a successful marriage without the invasion of the supernatural. What the cross promises a marriage is fresh starts and new beginnings. Amen. Uh, uh, Kim just uh, told me, for those of you as you're looking ahead and you're thinking, well, we have kids, what are we going to do for child care? We have a lot of students and youth in the room that babysit. In fact, uh, Drew and Zach, uh, guys, just stand up. They'll, they'll babysit uh, all your three- and four-year-olds. Uh, so uh, seriously, uh, it is worth it, God, whatever the cost, uh, make plans to be there. I do want to remind you we have a business meeting this Wednesday at uh, 630 and, uh, man, some exciting things uh, coming up. I want to encourage you to be there this Wednesday for the business meeting. We're starting a new ministry called Junction 56. It's for 5th and 6th graders. If you have a child, grandchild, or know someone who's currently in 3rd or 4th grade, uh, l launching next Sunday, and we're going to be talking, we have a meeting today at 4 for the leadership that's putting it together. Uh, we're actually, it will spend some time talking to the uh, those that come tonight through uh, WANA and talking to the third and fourth graders that will be rising, fifth and sixth graders. So anyway, it's a great opportunity, good ministry coming up. And also tonight at four, we will also have our administrative meeting and a new ministry, Jocelyn Sams has begun. I uh, want to encourage you to check that out. Run for God begins tomorrow at 6 p.m. We'll meet in the front lobby tomorrow. Run for God is a 12-week beginner running program. And so Jocelyn is also at the back table. Information back there. She's back there waving. If you'd like to participate in that, great, great opportunity of running and encouragement from the Word. And lastly, I want to mention today uh, that as you go out, I want to encourage you to come back tonight. You'll see the discipleship electives in your bulletin. Uh, we don't just print up that bulletin to take notes, but we put some important announcements in there. So please take it home, look over it. It's one way we communicate to you. Instead of doing 20 minutes of announcements, we only have to do 15 minutes of announcements. So please read that. Uh, that one of the discipleship electives, small group leader training, I lead. It's tonight at 5.30. I'm going to give an a unashamedly plug for that. We ask all of our host homes and small group leaders to take this, to kind of be certified. If you're thinking you might do that in the future, and encourage you to come out tonight at 5.30. And then uh, before Matt closes us in prayer, um, on our back information table and also by the prayer wall over there, uh, there's a reading list. I just want to encourage you to be reading the Bible every day. If you read a chapter a day according to this list, if you follow this plan, by the end of the year you've read the whole New Testament. And so I just want to encourage you, just another resource to pick up. Matt, if you would come. I'm going to ask you to stand as uh, Matt Webb closes us in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the message this morning. Thank you for Pastor Nathan and how you're working his life. And Lord, many of us have been attacked over and over by Satan, by the enemy. And it has affected our self-worth and our self-esteem. But help us to see ourselves as you see us and help us to go in power in the name of the Holy Spirit we pray in your name. Amen.